Box of candy, a bunch of flowers. <laughs> I don't need the park. Never flowers. Never flowers? No yeah. flowers. I got a good place for flowers, really. They can be wholesome. You never had a flower. I'm sorry. I quit buying I quit buying roses because oh, if you're giving them to your loved one they didn't smell well. Flowers are they didn't smell well. Flowers are Okay. Saint Valentine's died in the third century in Rome. His feast day is February fourteenth. There he is now. <laughs> there they are. You wore a red yarmulke on that must be yes. telling. Is that what this is? Oh, okay. Right. Like the hot the hot deal. The thing about yes, the hot deal. The thing is about Valentine is that the poor fellow got booted off the general Roman calendar in nineteen sixty-nine because they can't prove he existed. So instead what they did was they came up with uh, two stories or three stories, and they kind of telescope them together. Now, as Jews, we can, I mean, look, this is not our guy, but uh, we do believe in love. And um, he, it, uh, we have guys where they took two or three stories and they telescope them together. Okay, for example, um, fun fact, who killed Goliath? David. David. Actually, no, because later on in the text, you can barely see it, but there's a fellow named Elhanan, and he, he killed Goliath. Is that interesting? I, I had no idea. I mean, I knew, obviously, because if I hadn't looked it up, I couldn't tell you folks. But uh, <laughs> he only gets the one verse. See, that's what I, you know, advertisement for myself. This is what I tried to do in the book. That's right. I took these minor characters and I gave them a life, like Miriam and Keturah. I'm very fond of Keturah. Do we know Keturah? No. Keturah, you remember? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I never met <noticed> him. <laughs> oh, thanks. If it's the Fuller Brush Man, tell him I want to. Checks in the mail. Who remembers the Fuller Brush Man? Isn't that great? That was so cool. How did, why did Fuller Brush go out of business? Their stuff was too good. It never wore out. I wish I got the next year. I said, but I still have the brush and the comb and the whatever. Okay. Um, it is not unusual to have biblical characters who are actually two different people and their stories got telescoped together, as we say. Because nobody can go back in time except for some rabbis I had and uh, say what actually happened. In the case of St. Valentine, I mean, he's relatively late from a Jewish point of view, even though he's not Jewish. Third century, I mean, my goodness, by the third century, we've canonized the Bible, we've practically completed the Talmud, and all kinds of stuff is happening. We're also getting these really, really nice houses in, in Babylonia. That was the place to live. All right, so as far as uh, Valentine is concerned, let's see. They, they do recognize him as a saint of the church. Uh, apparently, he was a Roman priest and physician who suffered martyrdom during the persecution of Christians by an emperor you never heard of, Claudius II Gothicus, in the year 270. Uh, he was buried on the Via Flaminia. Flaminia, is that a woman named Flaminia, or was it on in flames at the time? Flaminia? Anybody's Latin better than mine? Flaminia. It's, it's a song by Groucho Marx. Lavinia, Lavinia. <laughs> okay. Olivia. Yes. And Pope Julius I reportedly built a basilica over his grave. Or he may have been a, a bishop. But this is the stuff that we all know because the people who make the candy. Who is that? Um, Barisina. Still? Where are you living? Seize. Seize candy. Barisini. Barisini got stepped on by Barton. Barton's. Seize, yes. Seize. S-E-E. Yes. You can read it backwards, too. Fanny Farmer. That's what I was saying. But there's somebody else. She's in all the... Whitman. Yes, Whitman. 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 Really, that's the higher price spread. The diet. Okay, <laughs> the version that the candy companies put out is that he was being kept in prisoner, he was being kept in prison by one of the Roman emperors, and he, um, he didn't fall in love with her, but he was her good friend. The jailer's daughter suffered from blindness, and Valentine cure, uh, healed her, he cured her, and so he would drop her little notes that said, from your Valentine. And that's where they came from. Before, and what's that candy with the words on it? That, yeah, that you're supposed to give when you're in the fourth grade. We did not have any of this stuff when I was in Yeshiva. No, we were all boys. I'm sure there was some who loved each other, but there was, they didn't get it. Okay? 
Um, but as a lover's festival, it dates from the 14th century. I have relatives who date from the 14th century. Okay. The Jewish Covenant of Love. This is from HuffPost, and it was written by Rabbi Bradley Artson. Do you know him, Rabbi Dr. Bradley Artson? He's uh, a big noise in the uh, University of Conservative Judaism out in California. And I met him once. Um, he, he's a very good speaker. And I said, you're a very good speaker. And he agreed with me. So, uh, <laughs> but this ties in with the Parsha. What mountain, what thing, somebody gave something to somebody else. Hint, not a box of chocolates. It's a mountain. Oh, okay, I'll give you a choice. Uh, let's see, Mount Olympus, Mount Sinai, and yes, two mountains in a hospital. Uh, anyway, this is this is this Torah portion is where we gather at Sinai and we receive the Torah. But you never say we receive the Torah. You say Zman Matan Torah in the time of the giving of the Torah. Now, why is it significant that they talk about giving the Torah and not necessarily receiving the Torah? Better to give than to receive. Okay, all right. Anybody else? The medieval uh, icon for that was the hand reaching out of the clouds holding the Torah, meaning that God is always offering us the Torah, but whether we receive it or not is totally up to us. So you've got divine will versus individual will. So as far as receiving the Torah, do you have to take the whole thing at once? No. What if there's a portion of the Torah that you... Uh, don't really care for. Should you just receive it sight unseen? And why is it so warm in here? Um, <laughs> well, for example, we talked about some strange mitzvot, like chalitza, if, if uh, A is married to B, and then A dies, but he has a brother, the brother is obligated to marry the widow, his sister-in-law. Is that something we're particularly fond of? No. 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 Has anyone ever been involved in that sort of thing? No. no. Oh, thankfully, no. Well, it really depends if your sister-in-law was a pretty yeah. girl. Oh. Yes. Oh, yes. yes I right. Right. But, on, but only in uh, Queens. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> only in Middle Village, the center of the universe. Do you know the Greenwich Meridian runs right through Middle Village? Um, Arthur, that's the first time you've spoken to me in the last three weeks and you didn't use the word concubine. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> I guess the is not over yet. <laughs> That's true. Very good. Touche. All right. So God makes a covenant with Israel. And this is this you can take to the bank, so to speak. God is the lover, Israel the beloved, and the Torah is the Nadunya. The Torah is the dowry. How's that for a metaphor? Yeah. Is that okay? All right. Um, so therefore we're talking about a covenant. And the covenant between two human beings is, is really not to be taken lightly, even though we live in a society where the divorce rate exceeds 50%, except in Los Angeles, where it's 75%. I don't know what they do out there, really. Don't ask. You don't want to know. Oh, okay, very good. <laughs> Thank you. Don't ask. But in terms of being in relationship with God, you are supposed to be with God as with a lover, which... Uh, does that complicate things or simplify them? You can't divorce them. <laughs> no. No, indeed. <laughs> what I love about Jews is even the ones who don't believe in God still say, thank God, or Hashem, Mir um, Hashem, God willing, all of those things. It's, it's very peculiar. It was the old story, Harry Golden, I know I'm dating myself now. Yeah. Harry Golden was a comic, sort of. Yes. Uh, he had some problems with the bankruptcy or counterfeiting. So he moved down to Charlotte, North Carolina, where they didn't know him. And he founded a newspaper called the Carolina Israelite. Okay? And uh, when he was growing up on the Lower East Side, his father was getting up on Shabbos morning, getting ready to go to shul. And Harry said, Papa, where are you going? He says, I'm going to shul. He says, but Papa, he says, you're an anarchist, you're a communist, you belong to the workman's circle, you don't believe in God. Why are you going to shul? He says, listen to me. He says, my friend Shapiro believes in God. He goes to shul to talk to God. I go to shul to talk to Shapiro. So <laughs> it's really okay. The beauty of Judaism is we don't have a Westminster Creed. We don't say you have to sign on the dotted line and say, I believe X, Y, Z. Your, your beliefs about God can evolve. 
Uh, when you're five years old, it's certainly different from when you're 50 years old. It's different when you're 80 years old. The important thing is, and you can't define God. I mean, Maimonides says you, you can't define God because you're limiting him. So he gives you a whole list of what God is not. See? Anyway, I, I thought it'd be fascinating on, on this uh, semi-Valentine's Day to uh, just discuss some more aspects of the relationship with God. Our relationship with God has got to involve tzedek. Tzedek, tzedek, tirdo. Justice, justice shall you pursue. What is the difference between the Latin-based word justice and the Hebrew word tzedek? If somebody, because tzedek doesn't mean justice, really. It means righteousness. A right, it follows that a righteous person has got to practice justice. And if somebody does, you call them a tzaddik. A tzaddik is a, a righteous person. Generally, the head of a Hasidic dynasty is called a tzaddik. And I assume this person models for the Hasidim. But uh, more, more than that, in, in terms of tzaddik, it's just do the right thing even when no one is looking. Okay? Now, what happens if somebody, you've met people like this, they, they put on like they're some kind of religious person, but uh, they're, they're, they're religious on the outside and phony baloney on the inside. What's the Yiddish expression for that? A tzaddik. Who is this? A tzaddik. Like, like a righteous et. Okay? Not quite approaching it, but, um, well, you, you shouldn't put on airs for other people. I'm not saying you have to be genuine all the time. I mean, you, you clearly your personality changes depending on the situation. But this is very good. Uh, oh, he says it was Philo, uh, P H I L O. He's um, tenth century. No, 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 no. He's a tenth century Egyptian Jewish uh, philosopher. I thought he was a baker. And it's actually uh, it was either said by him or Rabbi Nachman of Bratislav. Be kind for everyone you meet is fighting a hard battle. Can you be kind to everyone? No. No. It's very hard. Oh, be kind, but keep your hand on your wallet. Yeah. Okay. No, I, I don't. I don't really. Uh, well, what I'm happy about is coming from a metropolitan area. You learn not to trust just anybody. Okay. When I was a rabbi up in New Hampshire for 22 years, and the winter would come, I always knew I would have some strange people visiting me. I, I had this person who called me. And he said, Rabbi, you have to help me. That was always the beginning line. I said, what, what is the problem? He said, well, I'm driving a tractor trailer, and there's a safe in the cab, and it's got my keys and my wallet and all of my money, and I just locked myself out of the safe. And I said, well, you know, there are some holes in your story. Who keeps their wallet? If you're a guy, don't you keep your wallet in your back right pocket like everybody else? So he hung up. The next year, the next year, almost to the day, the phone rings, I pick it up, same guy, same guy, same story. It's, it's, it's totally remarkable. My favorite guy was um, Fred Flanders, the cowboy. He, he was a very thin little man who showed up every winter wearing a cowboy hat and asking me for something. There was one time, this is what I, shortly after I had first become the rabbi there, I had 35 kids in the religious school and I was teaching everybody. So it was Sunday school, I had the kids in, in the uh, common room, in the classroom, and the social hall was set up for a rummage sale, which means you've got everybody's clothing there. And Mr. Flanders comes in, because back in those days you didn't lock the door. He says, Rabbi, he says, I'm really cold, I really need an overcoat, could you give me an overcoat? And I, I, I don't have any tailors in my immediate family, but somewhere back over the centuries there's a vestigial section of my brain which, which does tailor. And I looked him up and up and down, I said, oh, 32 short. And I went and <laughs> <laughs> Then when he came to town, I was expected to be his taxi cab. I would drive him to the Episcopal Church because they allowed people to sleep in there. I drove him to McDonald's. It was really an adventure. And then there was the time when Mr. Flanders never came back. So um, I hope he's up there. I, I hope uh, he's putting in a good word for one and all. All right, the second idea of marriage, of love, even if you're not married, is shalom. Peace. Yes. But well, what's the difference between peace and shalom? Shalom covers a lot more. Shal yes, shalom is shlemut, wholeness. And the... Yes, and, and the symbol for shalom is the circle. 
unlike the word peace, which comes from the Latin word pax, which means a pact, which was the kind of thing that the Romans did. The Romans would come to town and tell the locals, if you make peace with us and give us tribute and pay taxes, we won't beat you up right now. So it, it's sort of like the schoolyard vision of peace, where uh, the big boy is going to beat up the little boy because he can. All right, so shalom and shlemut is something totally, totally different. And finally, racha, okay? If, if I know I'm, I'm using the uh, heterosexual sim symbolism, but when I do a wedding, and I, I do gay weddings, but I've got the groom and the bride, and I, I quote the line from, from the Talmud, which says, if your wife is shorter than you, bend over and take her advice. Because that way you avoid a world of hurt. You really do. Because, because men have one way of looking at things, and women have a very unique way of looking at things. I know I've told this story before, but I'll, I'll end with this. Uh, I'm standing in the living room, and Ann Beth says, look over there. And I go, where? What? She goes, look over there. And I go, where? She takes me by the arm and, and drags me over to a wall. And she made a very nice arrangement of Jewish stars, clay and metal and glass and so on. Oh, I said, that's so lovely. How long has it been up there? She goes, six months. So, <laughs> again, what can I say? It's a guy thing. Shabbat Shalom. Good Shabbos. And we'll light candles now. Okay. Um, you just have to strike the match, and uh, all the women are over there. Ladies, all please rise. We'll do all the blessing together. This is the cat. He knows all the blessings. Okay. Oh, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>
each for team. Yendi dine nefesh, avarak amar meshor avdak elchesol leonak. Yarus avdak imo ayak ishakave. Thank you. 
together on 358, um, and we'll do the whole thing together. Oh God, show us how to fashion holiness from waste, uncovering sparks and broken shells of people beaten down by circumstance, and mired in the border of holiness. Teach us to take a neutralized reality and create the sublime, forming shapes of blessings with a sacred touch. Instruct us in sympathy that we may learn to tear away at hopelessness and the groan and void of despair by stories, jokes, and astonishing embraces. 
Remove shallowness from our lives and destroy senselessness, that we may discover your plan and fulfill your purposes. Give us insight and vision, and we will perform the signs and wonders of the sight of all humanity, as you yourself once did in the land of Egypt and at Sinai. Show us life and all its glory, and we will glorify your name. Hear it now, everywhere, and forever. Amen.
אמר כי פעון אין יעקב, אם יעלו מיד חזר רק ממנו, מלוכת אדוני גל ישראל. Jewish, Gentile, friend, relative, anyone at all in need of healing, uh, please give us their name so we can recite before Shlema, a quick and speedy recovery, and then we'll read the top left-hand paragraph together. Thinking about our uh, good friend Howard E. Lachman, Rafur Shlema, and also Howard Shulman, uh, Rafur Shlema, about whom we're hearing uh, good things. So, yes. Rafur Shlema. Bob Walsh, Bosch Lane, Bosch Lane, Bosch Lane, Bosch Lane, Bosch Lane, Bosch Lane, James Basmajian, <laughs> um, Doreen Christopher's daughter, uh, of which I apologize, Doreen, I didn't write it down. I always say God knows who she is. God knows who she is, and thank you. Serafina Klein, Martin Reynolds, Mark Bozer, uh, Richard uh, Siever Jr., mm -hmm. and uh, Russell Schott. Mm -hmm. um, also, as always, we pray for our brothers and sisters in the embattled state of Israel and for our brave troops protecting our country all over the world. Let's read together on the top left hand of 33. Help us, Adonai, to lie down in peace and awaken us again, our sovereign to life. Spread over us your shelter of peace. Guide us with your good counsel. Save us because of your mercy. Shield us from enemies and pestilence, from starvation, sword, and sorrow. Remove the evil forces that surround us. Shelter us in the shadow of your wings, O God, who watches over us and delivers us, our gracious and merciful ruler. Guard our coming and our going. Grant us life and peace now and always. <coughs> spread over us the shelter of your peace. Praise you unto I, who spread the shelter of peace over us, over all his people in Israel, over Jerusalem and the entire world. Speaking of which, we also pray for the victims and those suffering from the coronavirus and for their families. <laughs> Shabbat 
the ark is closed, you may be seated. Unless you're saying mourner's cottage. Mourner's cottage, please remain standing. I think you should say it for the 17 uh, students that were killed in Parkland. Oh, yes. It's yeah, the first anniversary. Second. Of your second. Second. The second anniversary of the uh, murders in Parkland, so I'll ask everyone to please watch. Thank you, Lena. Mourner's cottage. Yeah. <laughs> uh, on, sun, on Sunday, 
Um, Annette Basloffinger, who has established a Holocaust Center for Remembrance and Learning, because she is a survivor, <coughs> is having the second event uh, for this season and is on the paper clip project. And uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with it, although it's happened a while ago, and I think we could all use a refresher about how students were taught exactly what six million means. We're going to have a film, Annette is going to speak, and Linda Mentor, one of our members, is going to speak as well. It's Sunday at three o'clock in the afternoon, and of course, there'll be coffee and cake. Of course. At the end of the month, we're going to be doing a mitzvah day project, um, collecting Passover food for those needy Jewish families who but it's tough for them to, to get hold of. It's, it's expensive that time of year. We're going to be working with the cupboard. It's a mitzvah day for Temple Shalom, and uh, we know that you'll all be participating in that. And as well, Passover is set. The first, come and be with us for the first Seder here on uh, Wednesday, April 8th. It's going to be wonderful. And I have the menu ready. When you're ready to sign up, come into the office and you can choose your beautiful kosher meal and we can celebrate our journey into freedom. And uh, I wish you all a sweet, healthy, beautiful Shabbos and a happy Rabbi Valentine's Day. <laughs> Very beautiful. <laughs> Wow, look at you. Glowing. I got a little shark in the background. I got a little shark in the background. I got a little shark in the